welcome to Saturday Morning Trek, just one of many podcasts on Trek FM. If you'd like to help keep Star Trek discussion coming your way each day, consider becoming a network patron through Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm and find out how you can become part of the team. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm. This is DC Fontana. You're listening to Trek FM. Future's here for us to see. It's 2280. Their mission to fight injustice, to right that which is wrong, and to boldly go where no man has gone before. Welcome to Saturday Morning Trek. Join us at Trek FM as we hearken back to the days of wood panel dens, console televisions, and art directors that can totally see all the colors. I'm Aaron Harvey. I'm Adam Drozen. Today we have part two of our interview with Bob Klein, layout artist and designer at Filmation. In our last episode, we left on a cliffhanger of sorts. If people know any of the deep cut information about TAS, it tends to be that the art director at Filmation was colorblind. That's why we have pink tribbles and purple Klingons, etc. Well, that story appears to be apocryphal. So let's jump back in and get the scoop. Oh, and by the way, Adam had to leave for an appointment about halfway through our interview, but thanks to the magic of editing, he's at the end of the podcast, so when Bob and I are the only ones talking, we didn't just leave Adam out. It's something that someone in the Babel conference asked about and Aaron was curious about was the uh, presence of the color pink in a lot of these episodes and the tribbles, and we, we know you had some opinions about this. <laughs> pink equals Irv Kaplan. <laughs> Irv Kaplan, you'll see his name in the credits as the color stylist. He was in charge of not only ink and paint and what color the various uh, characters and props and everything were. He was also, and he would do it himself in his office. He'd sit down with a cell and he'd paint it. And uh, he was also uh, uh, referred to by... um, uh, many people there as the purple and green guy so you'll see in a lot of scenes you'll see purple and green used together Klingons that was were one of his preferences and he also uh you know he made those dragons red i would never have made those dragons red he made the kazinti's costumes pink yeah right i love the kazinti's and i love my solution for designing them. But when they came back pink, it was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I know the original author was also mortified and, and Dorothy, Dorothy was like, I'm, I, I'm really sorry. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> But I had no, at that point in my career, I was drawing with a pencil. I mean, I did not have any control over color. And when something went wrong, I would complain and they asked me who I was. <laughs> Why am I here saying that? Um, so was he actually colorblind? Because we've heard that story. No, that... Uh, I did work for a guy at Disney that was colorblind, and he was in charge of creating uh, development art pieces. <laughs> oh, <laughs> which just didn't quite. Yeah, but so um, he, that's really interesting because that is sort of the the story that's been told for years and years and years that the reason things turned out pink is the person was colorblind and no. they should have been gray or brown or no it was wow it was all irv kaplan's call he had nothing but contempt for humanity i would <laughs> compare irv uh kaplan to uh what's the name of the fella david uh larry david oh okay irv was basically larry david and uh you know there wasn't anything that he could get excited about and um uh he felt that he had reached a real um pinnacle of success because he had a series of cartoons that he did that were published in playboy and they were little upa style characters that were very simplistic but you were able to identify their career area by the shape of their penis <laughs> and he thought this, this has was been just saturday morning track cl- <laughs> we're now clever, off the air no? <laughs> clever as as all get out so that was that was irv and he wasn't listening to anybody else when he picked colors or 
or did anything. And I don't believe he had any interest in Star Trek above the interest of, say, the Brady kids. You know, wow. I mean, it wasn't like he felt one project <laughs> was necessarily more worthy than another uh, of his concern. So I'm obsessed with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fascinated. Yes. With Irv. And poor Irv, he did pass away just recently. He and he and Lou Scheimer, up until their last days, had lunch together every week. Wow. And God bless. They were real pals. And he was he was part of the original group that created Filmation. Oh, okay. But he chose not to be a partner. Okay. Uh, there was Lou, and there was Norm Prescott, and there was Hal Sutherland. Is this back when the they partner. had the the office with the mannequin for yeah, the uh, yeah. the receptionist? That's right. <laughs> and uh, and Irv was with them, but he didn't want to make that financial commitment, ah. and so he never was a partner. And yet he was always treated royally by the guys because they were his friend and yeah. and close uh, close to him. Wow. So, yeah. Speaking of people who worked at Filmation, when we reviewed the Terraton incident, there was uh, one shot of the three Starfleet officers next to Lieutenant Gabler, who looked much more distinct than the average background characters. In fact, one of them was wearing glasses. So I took a screenshot and sent it to Dorothy, and she's like, I, I don't recognize these people, because I assumed that it had to be somebody specific. It was just, you know, they were more distinct than the background characters. Uh, so, uh, that picture of the four of us, uh, was drawn by Herb Hazelton and he was the guy who ultimately designed the main crew members. Okay. And, um, and you were saying that Shatner was a, a, a difficult character. And I even, uh, referenced, uh, Mort Drucker's, uh, drawings of Shatner that were in Mad Magazine for the first Star Trek, uh, parody that mm -hmm. they did and tried to make that work uh in a more realistic way and my drawings weren't uh accepted and finally it was uh, a drawing that herb did and um uh, herb uh was classically trained he's great uh he was a great artist um and he one of his favorite things to do was to take uh classic paintings old masters paintings and and put a tweak on them um and and he would he would put movie stars into uh uh paintings from the 15 1600s you know and uh but anyway he was he was excellent and so he he usually got the job of doing human beings and and you know there's a time honored tradition of putting crew members in incidental scenes in animation. I mean, um, uh, we've seen it in a lot of Disney cartoons. And, uh, Animaniacs. So, <laughs> uh, I yeah. mean, uh, Warner Brothers. And so uh, this is, we were the primary layout people uh, that are uh, in that uh, drawing. And uh, so it was me and Herb and uh, who have we got George there? Jensen. George Jensen is um, was uh, my roommate. We ha we shared a room uh, from uh, in the first year, and maybe the second year as well. Um, he is the brother of a famous actor uh, who d has done character roles uh, in Chinatown and Harper. Uh, I can't for the life of me remember his first name right now, but uh, anyway, George had experience working at Disney. He had uh, worked on the development of uh, Close Encounters, uh, drawing uh, all kinds of spacecraft for that, and uh, so he he was uh, also a classical, classically trained illustrator, and uh, I actually learned from him uh, in terms of uh, developing my own drawing and approach to drawing. Because I, I was very tight, and he was more loose mm. in the way he drew. And he left more up to the um, uh, assistants to clean up the drawings. And I, I wanted complete control over anything <laughs> I did, so my drawings were very tight. Uh, and then who else is there in that one besides myself? Is it George Good? Is uh, it, uh, no, it's the it's actually Lieutenant Gabler. He's the oh, he's yes, the actual yeah. guy, or as the, we call him, Lieutenant Obama. Yeah, because he right. looked an awful lot like uh, Obama in certain yes, scenes. Yes, yes, 
Yeah. Um, so there you are. That's that's uh, who those guys are, and uh, and that was fun. That was fun. Uh, well, one of the the ships that I really want to talk about is it's Mike Okuda's favorite ship, the mm -hmm. uh, the robot grain ship, mm -hmm. uh, which now I think is called the Antares. I think they oh okay. they they and one of them they they've sort of retconned the name that's in the new. Um, I believe the the robot ships are in more than one episode. More than uh, wouldn't surprise that. Yeah. Um, so you know it looks very different than your average Starfleet ship, but at the same time it does seem to have that genesis of uh, you know DNA of Starfleet. So. Right. Or Federation. So uh, I knew it was supposed to be a cargo ship. So everything I did to design it was with the idea that it was to carry cargo. And uh, so uh, I knew it had to be clunkier. Uh, it needed to look like it had a lot of space on it that was devoted to storage. And uh, I don't remember if it went through many uh, incarnations before the final version. Uh, and so once again, uh, at the time, of course, that classic version of the Enterprise was the be-all and end-all. Right. And um, so... I never wanted to design another Starfleet ship that looked more fun, more exciting than the Enterprise. I well, had at a, least that one would appear on screen. I imagine you still would wouldn't mind designing that. No, no, <laughs> I just didn't. I didn't feel it was the right way to approach the series. Yeah, you you needed to keep the Enterprise as the uh, epitome, the hero ship. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's that story. So what are some of the other permutations? I guess we kind of you can see them if you watch the time trap and freeze frame, but right. the you know, you said you went through a hundred different <laughs> versions yeah, of that. Yeah, the ship. thing that was so frustrating for me was that it was virtually my first assignment. And since I had gone there with, you know, this portfolio full of uh, spaceships and stuff, uh, it made sense that they gave me that. And I don't know that we had the show to lay out yet anyway. So um, we were start, sort of building up to that moment where we actually got scenes assigned to us and, and started doing a series of layouts for those scenes. Uh, and they needed the ship. And uh, I was getting very little feedback other than that isn't it. <laughs> <laughs> and it has to look more like something we've never seen before. And I can remember myself at the time, and this is the kind of thing w would happen to me even in, in art school, was that if the teacher came at me with that kind of requirement that it had to be, uh, you know, which is an unfair thing to ask for anyway, uh, something we've never seen before, right. um, uh, my comeback would always be, well, I have to get at it in stages. I have to do mm. this and then this and then this and find that it isn't the right thing and just keep keep iterating evolving yeah uh in my thinking and uh that's why so many versions got done for for that and it was just okay that doesn't work and these didn't work so what's different from all of them and and that's how it it finally came about and again i don't think there was much in the way of, of feedback. Um, I do believe that at some point the term organic did come up as feedback, but I don't think it was any more or specific or something than that. like that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Cause I think that's what they, even in the script, eventually they, they say something that it was a, a the, it was spun or whatever the, the, the yeah, yeah yeah like like say spiders had, yes had, had, had well it never quite got there uh, and maybe that was something that uh, I can't imagine it was added in later though I don't think there was a script for me to work from interesting is the okay. deal I think it was before the script was I mean, finished it's literally the first episode yeah so. yeah and. Uh, and I remember working on some design ideas without having a script yet, but they someone would just pitch what the idea of the thing was going to be. And uh, I do believe there are examples where I designed the thing and then they used it in the storyboard uh, afterwards oh, as opposed to the other way around that mm -hmm. I talked about before. I think... Um, uh, uh, Kukulkan is an example of that, that uh, 
that uh, they needed the ship that looked like the Aztec uh, flying uh, serpent. And I think I designed it first, and then they Xeroxed and pasted it into the storyboard panels. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, and that, of course, is the episode that won an Emmy. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the only Emmy that yes. Filmation ever got. And or Star Trek at that point. It really rankled um, Lou Scheimer because he felt his Fat Albert show was the one that developed or yeah. deserved the Emmy. And socially, uh, it probably you know had a bigger impact. In this. But for me... My yeah. first, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was it was a thrill. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> uh, some of the other ships that we were talking about recently, um, there's a, a another podcast, video podcast called Trek Yards, uh-huh. and they take all the different Star Trek ships and they talk about them and what they what they can do. And they've just started an animated series month, right? So they started talking about the first one they did was the Aqua Shuttle, yeah, and they were debating, and and I thought I'd ask the person who actually designed it themselves. <laughs> Uh, does it have warp capability or is it just, uh, you know, more interplanetary and then just goes underwater, you know? Was my only thinking uh, when I designed it. Okay. It was like, okay, this is a boat. Okay. <laughs> and then there's also, speaking of the boat, there is like... Oh, a, oh a I'm sorry. I thought no, no, that no. is what you no, were no, talking about. No, no, no. Sorry. About. Let me... I'm... This. Oh, yeah. The no, that would have warp drive. Okay, so it did have warp That's drive. That's why it has the two nacelles. Okay. I figured... That kept it in the Star Trek universe, and uh, it looked like, uh, what, what was the super marionation show? Uh, uh, supercar. Wasn't that ah, it? Ah, okay. Where it went underwater? Yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. In the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Supercar. Supercar. With beauty and grace, as swift as can be. Watch it flying through the air. It travels in space or under the sea, and it can journey anywhere. Supercar! Supercar! So that was in the back of my head when I was designing that thing, because I thought, you know, okay, this needs to be able to do both. And And it's got sort of a hydrofoil sort of thing going on there. But it's obviously, you're not going to cram a lot of people in there either. No. I don't remember what the scale was in the show. Well, but I don't it think was they could have crammed small. all of those shuttles into the <laughs> into the hangar. I mean Anyway. <laughs> Voy- yeah. Voyager had that same problem. They built the Delta Flyer when they were there. And yes. if you look at the door to the Voyager and the ship, they will they d- did not work. So yeah. you just had to imagine it was like a TARDIS door or something from Doctor Who and then you just That's right. fit through it magically. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, that we uh so that was one of the things that they were, you know, like, what was yeah, the top that, speed? That's what was what the... I, uh, I remember. That's my best memory of that particular thing was that it was definitely meant to be because it was called an aqua shuttle, right. I think. And the fact that it was referred to as a shuttle at all made me think that, okay, it does need to have that capability. Okay. So did the uh, the raft that comes out of it, the um, I think that had a name too besides raft, but did that come from the aqua shuttle or is that something separate that they would have brought down? Yeah, that's a good question. I really don't remember how that worked. Okay. Because uh, it seems like this is a solid, it doesn't look like it's inflatable in any way. So. No, I don't think it was meant to be. And you can see the scale there. Yeah. Uh, with the guy standing, so it's not going to fit it. into that anyway. No. So that's that's not going to work. Okay. And, uh, yeah, yeah, and at that point too, there was this other uh, way of thinking about any design requirement, and that wasn't any sort of uh, where would it go beyond this episode. It was always right. okay. What do we need for this mm-hmm. story? And uh, so, like for the the heavy shuttle. That yeah, was in Mud's passion. Right. Why was th- th- was that a particular reason they needed that shuttle as opposed to just a regular standard shuttle? I can't remember. And isn't it so different? Yeah, it, it's, it's like, and I know I designed it's it larger too. Uh, I just don't know what the thinking was, unless I don't even know that it was left up to me to decide. Hmm. But um, it really, it really looks like. My thinking at the time, I think that the uh, best guess is that perhaps, and this may be another one of those deals where it, there was something on the storyboard that showed a different shuttle, and I just went, okay, so they want a different one. I'll make a different one. Okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And to me, this actually 
the shuttle is more aerodynamic and it, it looks more like a shuttle that you would use than the the kind of the boxy Galileo right. type. You know, right. it's just and like, maybe that was and pu- this is, me reacting to that. It could be, yeah. Because uh, at the time of watching the original series in its original airing, mm-hmm. uh, when I first saw the shuttle, it was like, oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and that was, of course, because of money. You know, they did have like a much more, you know, rounded, although it looked a little bit more 50s probably than it should have. Yeah. But it didn't look like, you know, a- square angles are very easy to make with wood as opposed right. to curves and which is why yeah. by the way the uh bridge is angles instead of yep. complete circles except and for in the animated series it, it actually there's the yeah. the bridge itself is and totally i circular. did those drawings did you oh yeah. because um nobody else and that famous down shot yeah that's mine and the one where ahura is like yeah, yeah. And, and <laughs> no matter what's are, happening. There's another one yeah. where they're actually sitting in normal yeah. poses, but... They'll uh, transpose them sometimes. That you know. was one of my first uh, nice. assignments as well. Was, Did you add the extra turbo lift? Uh, it was asked for. Oh, okay. Because they thought they would need it. Oh, okay. Uh, and there's this whole thing about screen direction where if you go in this way, you got to go out that way and right. stuff like that. So, uh, Oh, then I they think... wouldn't have to turn them around? Exactly. Oh, uh, well, so, that's interesting. And, and you know, the trouble with flopping the Star Trek characters is the... The badge. Yeah. So uh, they tried to, to avoid that um, right. when they could. Interesting. Um, Not quite exactly the same. The Copernicus shuttle, which was in the slaver weapon, which... yeah is kind of pointy. And I have no idea why it's yet another (laughs) shuttle. But I know I designed it. I just don't know. I can't remember now why it was different. Well, what's interesting is that that didn't necessarily, that that shuttle didn't have to come from the Enterprise because we never see them where they come from. It could have been from a star base. And there was, in my understanding of the Star Trek universe at the time, that there were different uh, designs within the whole mm-hmm. uh, Starfleet, uh, and and I wanted I wanted to try things that didn't yeah. look like the box. And well, I think I think Don Christensen, as the art director, wanted to as well. He wanted to make things more interesting when we had the opportunity to right. do it. So you didn't he, have to pay. He sort to, of pushed me in yeah. that direction. And there's no budget on imagination for what you can make them look like. Well, so. and the only real restriction is if you're going to animate it in dimension. Right. And most of the time they didn't. They either did a second pass <laughs> mm-hmm. of it going between the stars where, you know, if you watch the show, you can see the paths where the star uh, oh, ship right. is going to go because yep. there's no stars to show Like through. in Scooby-Doo when you can tell there's a secret panel because it's a different color. from. But the... this is more like how do you accommodate a double exposure? Because the background is black, and right. so you can do a double exposure and the, and the ship will look solid as long as no stars, stars show are... through. Yep. Um... So that's that's that story, and okay. I wish I could remember why that one uh, looks different, it's, other than the prompting of the art director and possibly whatever was on the storyboard. Mm. It's interesting that it's it predates the space shuttle, kind of. I mean, like they were in development at that point, but it, it does have sort of a a little bit of the nose of the shuttle, you know, sort of look to it, which is interesting. Yeah, it's that would cool. be coincidence. Yeah, but. Uh, so what are did you uh, did you create the life support belt? Oh golly, I don't even remember. Where, oh yes, the, 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 yes, they, I know what you're saying. Yes. So they don't have to put a spacesuit on them. I can't. <laughs> I can't say that I did. I it, it, there's nothing specific about the design that makes me certain that I did it. Uh, it could have been the very first person that had to lay out. Uh, I mean, in general, it's a belt scene with, with the, thing the belt. On the back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And perhaps that person uh, said, "Okay, this is what I'm doing." And we were all in the same hallway there, so <laughs> we we uh, shared ideas like that as soon as possible, and also asked other people, oh, "Did you design this yet?" <laughs> oh, right. okay, I'll do that. I've got time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Um, what would like if you if the show went on? You know, if it went a couple more seasons or something, yeah. what would you have liked to have designed? What would have been oh, like, like yeah. in the universe? That's great. That's a great question. I, uh, I, it, it's really, it's really hard to say. I think my favorite thing about space, 
programs, uh, uh, interstellar things, mm -hmm. is to do uh, aliens that don't look humanoid. And that's why I enjoyed doing those artichoke guys. <laughs> and uh, well, they had quite a few of those, which, you know, people would say, oh, they had all, all this opportunity to do something and they just made people. I'm like, no, but there was the the Vendosian, Vin, I think is like the one who, uh, uh, Carter Winston, who could shape shift. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, and they, the, the eye of the beholder. There was. A, so I would want to do that. And yeah. then I would want to explore the environments oh, okay. uh, that they would live in. Uh, it always reminds me of Forbidden Planet and the Krell and mm -hmm. their underground stuff and the doorway thing. You know? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Imagine what a Krell looks like. Well, look at that door. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, it was kind of like in the, in the very first episode in the uh, Beyond the Farthest Star, they had like the big doors and stuff like that, too. Exactly. Kind of yeah. Exactly. Oh, by the way, in Beyond the Farthest Star, the insect creature appears on mm -hmm. the screen. I had... Uh, done a separate element for a mouth that would uh, sync to the dialogue. Yeah. And it was like pinchers on an insect oh, okay. mouth. And uh, they just, eh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they didn't bother. All they had to do was like two more drawings to have it move. Yeah. And uh, they could have sunk. And it was just the one shot or maybe a couple. Yeah. Well, there might have been a wider shot. Yeah. A close up. But but it just seemed like, w why are you passing up this opportunity? Yeah. It doesn't. Co and of course, I didn't know that they hadn't animated it until uh, it, I saw the finished edited show on the mm -hmm. movie Ola which was probably one of my most disappointing moments in my life. Oh, We were talking about uh, the Superman cartoons earlier, yeah. and the whole time that I was working on that first show, that's what was in my head, was the idea that possibly... <laughs> it would look like that. Well, and it's one of the things that m makes you work hard at something, yeah. is the idea that here, in your head, you're seeing how uh, it would ultimately be. And, you know, uh, when you're that age, when you're that young, mm -hmm. it's easy to make that assumption or fantasize about that yeah. idea. And um, so the first screening of the show was like, oh, really? <laughs> uh, and, of course, I watched it recently. Uh, uh, and... I am a fan of what it ended up being yeah. like. And uh, as you said, especially in the context of what Saturn Morning was like at the time. Mm -hmm. And even the Times uh, uh, reviewer said the same thing, essentially, when he was uh, uh, lauding it. I think saying, I may have actually read that re review. Uh, oh, yeah. The, it, talking real quick, this is a question that I had from before, which I forgot to ask. You, we were talking about the recording of the audio. Yeah. There's one question that nobody seems to be able to answer yeah. is that was everybody together at the same time? Was everybody together for like the first two episodes and then they were scattered to the wind? Or they, you know, nobody knows what, you know, you've got one person saying, oh, they never recorded together. That's why, you know, they're not reacting to each other. And the other right. one's like, no, every episode they were always there. Uh, <laughs> it's it's. It's my understanding, and I was never at a recording session, so I don't know for certain, but it's my understanding that they were able to get them together, uh, at least for the photo shoot uh, in the recording booth. Mm -hmm. uh, they may have, at that time, recorded some of a show okay. together. Uh, but it was my understanding that most of the recording came in over the phone. So they literally okay. phoned it in. And uh, they had, they had their, really good the sound equipment. quality on those phones. <laughs> the, well, the, the the equipment was good enough yeah. that they could do that. Well, I know the the little kid who played uh, young Spock. Yes, he like some of his stuff that they were just test recording him, and then they just used that test recording because they liked his spontaneity and his sort of uncertainness of things. And these these guys were all doing other stuff. You know, there there was no way they could get them all together in Reseda, so. Um, okay, that makes sense. I would say some of both. Okay. And more... Uh, more of a part. More <laughs> of the per percentage was a part. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that explains the Kukulkan and the Kukulakan Ku thing. Yeah. Because... Or Orions. Mm -hmm. The Orions. Oh, yeah, yeah. Orions. The Orions. I've, <laughs> I've had those. They're delicious. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I think we're going to have to create that now for the, the cover art or something. Orion cookies. 
Uh, that's interesting. Green with a pink f- filling. <laughs> In a purple bag. <laughs> yes, perfect. <laughs> with a pink label. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. Um, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, let's see. Ships. There was something about recording, drawing. I don't remember. Um Let's see, what a, anything else that you want to talk about? Well, were, all I wanted were, to say yeah. was it was like the perfect thing. It's like uh, when, I was, when I was in the Air Force, I was lucky that in boot camp, the, guy, the two guys that ran our uh, flight, uh, uh, one w- was a um, sergeant and, and the other was an airman, and uh, they found out early on that I could draw and they guided me because uh, at that point it was hard to get in the Air Force at all because of Vietnam. And, uh, and, but there was this thing that if you volunteered, you could uh, work in your area of specialty if you could pass the necessary tests, which I did. And so I ended up being an illustrator in the Air Force. And, and it's like that same luck and good fortune happened uh, in going to uh, filmation and having my first job in animation on a show that I, I can't imagine <laughs> anything more fun than that. And yet later on, I got to work on things that I uh, were as much fun, like like uh, Tarzan and, and Gargoyles and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a great experience and... Uh, I, I measured all the rest of my experiences by that and the fact that I had so much control over the show. Now, I didn't get a big screen credit for it because I was brand new. Right. You know? And so I'm lumped in with all the other layout people, which are legion. It got to the point where if I wanted to show or be, you couldn't show anything to anybody. There wasn't a video recorder yet. So... I knew where my name would appear on the screen instant, you know, for just an instant. So I'd go up to the screen. There was a room full of people and I would point to where my name was going to be. Uh, I was so, so proud of that. And I was especially proud of the fact that uh, it got that great review in, uh, in the times. Oh, and the LA times had a regular uh, weekly TV guide. And uh, I did the art that's on the cover one oh. week when Star Trek debuted. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, you know, ink and, and marker. Is that the one where everybody's running? No, no, tra- that's oh, okay. that's a Herb Hazelton drawing. Okay. My drawing has Spock looking in the viewer oh. on the... Uh, on the um, uh, bridge? Uh, bridge, and, and, and uh, Kirk is in the background. I don't know if I've ever seen that one. And they're both just basically on model from mm-hmm. the animation models. Okay. That, but I, you know, I, I created the composition and nice. drew it and colored it, and, and it's all done with, with markers. <laughs> and they cropped it by keeping the rough edges of the drawing around <laughs> the outside, which was never intended to be the case, yeah. but it's uh, it's it gives you an example of what publishing is all yeah. about. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's funny. Um, one last question. Uh, what well, you were talking about, you know, watching the episodes when they when they would screen them. Did did you guys notice like the bloopers, like certain things, like oh, Scotty has no pants. Yeah, he literally has no b- lower body. Yeah, you know? like yeah. It was usually something that the cameraman uh, either did on purpose or by accident oh. in order to uh, keep the cell levels to six, because you couldn't use more than six cell levels oh, I see. Uh, w- under the camera. And Did so, you get, start to get like, uh, uh, the opacity would be oh, start yeah. to mess it, it would Because the would, acetate is... Well, it's, it's, it's true in terms of the color. They had um, taken, like the blue for the shirt, mm-hmm. uh, uh, would, they'd have four or five different versions of that blue to accommodate the cell levels. Interesting. So okay. that when the arm was a separate cell level and would move, you wouldn't see the color different gotcha. from the color okay. underneath. That so, makes a lot of sense. So that would be a, a blooper uh, if you had the different color. But mm-hmm. that, it rarely happened because uh, they had already accounted for that. 
And if you watch older cartoons, uh, uh, theatrical cartoons and stuff, you'll see that phenomenon, mm -hmm. especially when they started to introduce limited animation where you just see one part of the character move. And they, they wouldn't have made that uh, correction in the color. So... Yeah. Um, yeah, that that uh, the bloopers that appear are somewhat regular. The the show that had the most uh, bloopers with regard to that, as far as I remember, was Fat Albert, because they had this one stock classroom scene where they'd have all the kids in the one scene, and they all had separate parts oh. so there was no way you could accommodate so if you watched old fat albert shows you'd see any number of those scenes <laughs> where there's parts of those kids missing <laughs> but usually it was not a big deal because it wasn't the guy that was talking or right. you know the scene was so short yeah. that you couldn't ac accommodate or account for all the body parts that's interesting. But uh, yeah, it happened in Star okay. Trek and it and it's usually for that reason okay. that oh god, well, we, we've exceeded our limit. <laughs> so what's going to be missed the least? <laughs> right. That makes sense. Yeah. Because you, and some of them you don't notice until you like, you know, cuz we've watched them multiple times yes. <laughs> that you don't notice them until you actually go back oh. and there is one person at the at last year's Star Trek Las Vegas um, who went as an animation error of Nurse Chapel. She had one <laughs> red sleeve by accident. And that's so great. she went to Nurse Chapel with the one red that's sleeve. That's wonderful. And so that was, that was that's, so much fun to see. great. We and saw glommers. We saw all sorts of... Sometimes characters are painted wrong. You know, mm. when you said that about Nurse yeah. Chapel, I thought, oh yeah, I'll bet they, there are ones where hair's the wrong color for no good reason that you can think of <laughs> other than somebody's not paying attention. Well, it's and, better than the power records from the 70s where we had a white Uhura a black a Sulu, uh, <laughs> and Emress was like a blue kind of avatar-looking creature. It wasn't even like the right species. So they, I don't know what they were looking at. But they... Spe speaking of Emress, mm -hmm. um, that was one of the only aliens that uh, that um, uh, what's Herb? his name uh, Herb Hazelton okay. uh, designed. Okay. Uh, I didn't get to do her, but I did get to do Lieutenant Eric. Oh, good. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. And uh, there was a fellow there, and I wish I could remember his name, but he went on to be uh, a guy who made models for special effects, uh, spaceships. And at the time, he was a cell cleaner down there working with acetone. So mm. whether he's even alive today yep. would be a question. <laughs> But uh, he made a high. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, he made a bust of Eric's for wow. me. Uh, base uh, he, he the uh, the body upper body was a styrofoam carving that he did and mm -hmm. painted, and then the head was uh, he pulled a foam uh, hollow um, uh, thing off of a plaster sculpture that he did yeah. and it was just a little you know maybe six yeah. inches tall and um and uh he painted it all according to the cells and so forth it was oh, one of cool. the loveliest things i ever received and he he was a big fan of of eric's um, i've always wanted an eric's action figure <laughs> yeah, with with all those articulations, yeah. it would be wonderful. That would be amazing. Uh, I'm really hoping that in the new series that we see uh, Edosian or that be whatever fun? that they changed him to. They one of the I think it was David Mack, I believe uh, one of the the Trek authors had changed his species. Uh -huh. I'm like, why did you? There was no why reason bother? to do that. Yeah. He goes, oh no no, we're always confused with Edosians. They're they're a lot more animated than we are. <laughs> I was like, ah, so <laughs> that's funny, that's but. Great. Uh, so yeah, no, I think it would be really cool to see oh. you know, some of those because now you can do that. It's well, yeah. absolutely you can. So I was so excited when in Enterprise they showed that Gorn. I yeah. thought, oh great! And they had a Saylot too. Yes, that's right. Did, did you do the Saylot? I did design yeah. the Saylot. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And uh, and sad yeah. for every person who ever <laughs> watched that episode and cried. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like, oh. Yes. I I and they should, I think. Uh, I don't know if, if Dorothy was or somebody. She had a friend that had a cat named Aichaya that they named their cat oh, after. Oh, very yeah. cool. So Very cool. Yeah, and I, of course I designed that thing. Yeah. 
That that was great. Oh, the the cat, the the, the, the yeah the, that he fights with. Yeah, yeah. Who looks a lot like Battle Cat in some ways. Yes, it from, does. From He Man. He Man. Yes. I had nothing to do with that. I did no designing on He Man. I uh, I uh, I don't. In fact, we had done a show prior to He Man called Black Star. Oh yeah, my and, friend Sean worked uh, on that. There are people who think that there's a connection, and oh, it never occurred to me. But I did all of the pitch art for Black Star and um, basically came up with the original visual okay. look of the thing and helped to develop the actual content. There's some the, posters you know, on eBay of Black Star and stuff yeah, that are yeah. right there. And, uh, and, uh, and there is, you can see a relationship, especially between the early uh, pitch art mm-hmm. uh, and, and He Man. But it. it, it well, it, since the... it was up to someone just recently to tell me, well, it, it, which came first, and what? Went... And I thought, oh God, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's possible. You well, know, I mean, I the, just don't know the. Well, no, it's like time wise. It's like because that's in the future. I know that uh, what is it? The King and Queen of Eternia came, or the the Queen did. She was an astronaut or something, and came to to Eternia from Earth. Yeah, yeah. At least I think that's what they said. And then they used that as part of the Christmas special that they did. Yeah. They, so they could get Earth kids to uh, to Eternia. Yeah, I... I uh, that's I'm not... I'm I'm in no way a He-Man uh, expert <laughs> in any way. Uh, I remember what I remembered watching when I babysat kids, and that's about it. So it's like... Yeah. It was sort of not my... It was my brothers. It was more of them. I, I had moved past it. I was in Robotech at that point. Well, my it, son. <laughs> my son had a lot of the He-Man uh, toys. Yeah. I remember him having a battle cat. Yeah. Yeah. Trap jaw, battle cat, and He-Man each sold separately, string not included. That hook won't stop He-Man. In trap jaw, we use his vicious claw. Still no contest. In trap jaw, we use his wicked laser. Even a one-armed army can't stop He-Man and battle cat. You win this time, He-Man. Trap jaw figure from the Masters of the Universe collection. He-Man and battle cat figures each sold separately from Mattel. Tim Han said he was very curious if Bob Klein could be convinced into redoing some of the animation today for TAS compared to the budget uh, Filmation had in the 70s. What exactly would you change? Like yeah, you it's, a it's an interesting question because uh, Tom uh, Tatternowitz, who uh, I know from uh, Filmation back before I even left there, which was the late 70s, early 80s, um, he uh, uh, has his own studio, G7 Animation, which you can find on the internet. Um, and I worked with him uh, a few years back on a on an adaptation of uh, L. Frank Baum's uh, The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus. And uh, we did an awful lot of work on that over a three-year period. And uh, as far as I know, the film still hasn't seen the light of day, but... Uh, uh, we had a lot of fun working on it. And um, uh, Tom, during the course of working with him, we had a lot of conversations, and one of them was, how would we do Star Trek? Uh, and um, we would want to do it 2D animation. We would want to reflect contemporary uh, styling uh, because it works for for uh, full animation. Mm-hmm. And uh, we could get much uh, better animation today. Uh, uh, so um, I've actually seen somebody doing demonstration cells uh, setups on uh, on the um, internet for Star Trek characters that I found to be just gorgeous. And uh, I would reference those and I don't know the artist. I think we're talking about know. the same person actually because I, I we're gonna have him on uh he I uh, forget his name, this is horrible, I'll loop it in. And Darren Doctorman, who worked on Enterprise, uh both pitched that. I think it's the two th- it, the two thousand nine style of like the Kelvin universe. Sure. Um is it had like the big expansive backgrounds and they're like little characters on a big big landscape. That's sort of not and, what I saw. What okay. I saw that I was impressed by were like um uh, sort of uh, one shots or two shots of characters against 
beautifully designed backgrounds and the characters I think we're talking about the same were thing. simplistic uh, but the but the mm-hmm. characters themselves were filling most of the frame they oh, were okay. like waist up okay. characters and both male and female and I think they were basically Starfleet uh, uniforms and uh, yet I don't remember that the characters were specific characters I thought they were more like uh, oh here's new characters that are in Starfleet um, but they were humans and they, uh, they were just beautifully done. Mm-hmm. And, um, I would reference those. I think I collected those somewhere. Uh, and, uh, and if it were a project I was attached to, those would be the first things I would show. Uh, I wish I knew who, who did them. Uh, but well, they were great. Well, I know we've been going on for Star Trek for a good, good little bit, but I'd be remiss if I didn't ask a couple quick questions about some of my favorite shows from the 90s that you'd worked on, uh, the first of which I, I still remember quite fondly from uh, Warner Brothers, The Animaniacs. Oh, yeah, The Animaniacs. Uh, Tom Ruger, who was the producer and uh, showrunner on that, uh, and I were friends at Filmation. Uh, Tom was a writer there. And um, we uh, saw each other socially and hung out uh, before either couples had any kids. And, and so I've known Tom forever. And uh, at one point between contracts uh, at Disney, he uh, just was relentless in his desire to have me come over to uh, Warner Brothers and work there for a while. And so that was around the early 90s. Uh, and, uh, they had already done tiny tunes and they were in the midst of doing Animaniacs. And since I had done, uh, uncountable number of storyboards, he thought it would be fun for me to direct, uh, an Animaniacs or two, uh, with, uh, what's it, uh, Yakko Wacko and, and, and Dot, Dot, but don't call uh, her Dottie. <laughs> yeah, if, you, right. if you call her Dottie, you die. <laughs> and and the three shows that he did uh, for Spielberg uh, were just wonderful. The uh, Tiny Toons and the Animaniacs. Freakazoid. 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 Oh, I love yeah. Freakazoid. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. All of these and, shows, uh, I still will randomly pull quotes out or something like that. I think I somewhat memorized the uh, Nations of the World song. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Randy Rogel, who's, yeah. who's also a friend, uh, did that. Wow. And the And the capitals the state capital mm-hmm. song and and i think he did the w- one about the uh, uh oh the universe elements. oh the, the elements okay yeah uh but uh yeah um i didn't direct a lot of things i did the one the game show one and i did the one with um the, the two people caught in the elevator it was wacko and uh, the professor what's his name oh I don't remember. I know the professor character, the nurse. Yeah. Yeah. They were stuck in the elevator for that episode and he just drove the guy nuts, (laughs) you know, but it was based on a real event, uh, which was me. And, uh, I can't remember her name. The, um, the voice director for the show and I were stuck in the elevator together at the, the building there uh, that we worked in, uh, in the Reseda. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, oh. it's actually, uh, in a big mall and it's a high rise and we, we were up. Oh, on... universal city. No, no, it wasn't there either. It's at the <laughs> corner. It's a, it's like a, a mall at the corner of Sepulveda and Ventura Boulevard. Oh, okay. uh, so it's a Sherman Oaks uh, okay. mall or something like that. Gotcha. Um, Anyway, she and I were in there, and you know, we told Tom about it, and it was like, "Oh yes, well, there's a story." <laughs> so I I storyboarded that one and and directed it, and um, and what else? There may have been one other, but those two, uh, I remember clearly. And most of my time at Warner Brothers, which was only about a year and a half, was spent uh, helping people come up with show ideas out of which came the uh, Tweety and Sylvester mysteries. Oh, okay. that was good, yeah. And a young woman who had nothing to do with art or writing or anything, she came up with the idea. And Jean McCurdy, who was the head of the whole operation there, 
was looking for a Tweety thing because Tweety was like a big deal at the time. And uh, oh, I don't remember that. And so she was looking for a Tweety and Sylvester thing, and that was it. And and people were all over the map. I mean, everyone on the staff when they got some downtime was working on an idea. So huh. there were like dozens of ideas, and I helped them along with. Okay, you Why need this. I've stumbled into that in the nineties. I'm like, I was around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> It was a great exercise, and That's I don't cool. know what became of all the show ideas. Is that how they got the Elmira show, or what, the one with Elmira and Pinky and the Brain? No, you know, okay. Pinky and the that Brain. that one was weird. <laughs> Pinky and the Brain, uh, Tom Menton, and, um, and what's his name? Eddie Fitzgerald are the models for Pinky and the Brain, as, oh. as is well known. But it was really Tom Minton that came up with Pinky and the Brain, okay. uh, is my understanding. Uh, Tom and I had offices right next to one another, and we we collaborated on a lot of stuff, which never <clears throat> saw the light of day. I I did a I mentioned Space Patrol before mm-hmm. as being a favorite of mine when I was a kid. I did like a a Space Patrol a Patrol parody oh. that uh, uh, Gene McCurdy looked at and said, "I don't get it." Uh, Which now would be on Cartoon Network, probably, and be amazingly popular. And then uh, the other thing that I really loved doing with Tom was a full uh, six-minute cartoon parody of Forbidden Planet. Oh, that's great. Oh, wow. And we put, you know, Bugs in the Leslie Nielsen part, and we had Marvin the Martian as (laughs) Robbie the Robot, and we had the, what's the name of the red character that's all fur gossamer oh, yeah, yeah gossamer, gossamer i love that was the creature from the id which uh appears by um i think daffy duck squeezing uh uh elmer fudd who is in the walter pigeon role uh, squeezing him and the thing pops out of his head <laughs> <laughs> and uh oh uh the female bunny that's in the oh anime, yeah uh, or uh, tiny tunes Babs yeah, yeah. She, she a version of her is the um, oh Vina uh, or whatever uh, no, was the, um, uh, Anne Francis character yeah. uh, Alt- Altera oh yeah that's right Alta <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, real quickly another one that I know a lot of people really love and this one maybe has even more of a cult following these days than Animaniacs and I, I definitely remember the toys when I was a kid uh, the gargoyles. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that was that was uh, Greg Wiseman from beginning to end, and uh, Greg Wiseman has worked on lots of stuff. is very, very talented, and and it was his his way of Disney doing a Batman toned show. Hmm. And uh, uh, we, Gary, we've talked. Know, I'm sorry to cut you off. We talked yeah. about how much we we love that Batman animated series. You can imagine that must have been really popular at the time, and other animators oh, must have wanted yeah, that. Yeah. Well, and and uh, Gary Kreisel, who was in charge of the the TV animation, he was determined to do some kind of uh, thing that would have that you know appeal to that same audience Darkwing that was Duck. loving Batman. <laughs> and yeah, Darkwing Duck. Also very popular. Uh, uh, was originally, do you know what it was originally called? No. But uh, Albert Broccoli wouldn't let us use it. Double O Duck. Oh, no Double way. Duck. And I actually have uh, Tad Stones, who was running the pre production on that, um, had cloisonne pins made up of Double O Duck. And wow. I have one on my Disney jacket. At nice. Home. Yeah. So, so, uh, they wouldn't, the Broccoli wouldn't let them use Double O. And so that's when they did a contest, and everyone in the department submitted names, and it was Darkwing Duck that won. So it wasn't originally meant to be Batman so much as it was meant to be a uh, spy. Uh, okay. But Gargoyles was in that same mold of a Batman style. Yes, thing. definitely. And, um, and yet they wanted to keep it far enough. And, of course, they didn't have any superheroes then. <laughs> Now yeah, they've got now all they, of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or at least half of yes. all of them. Hey, they but, had Dick, uh, they had Dick, Disney had Dick Tracy. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. you know what impressed me was that they got... Um, 
they got Spider-Man back from Sony yes. or whoever. Kind of, or something like that. I don't know right? how it works. I don't yeah. know what the actual uh, contractual thing is, but I love that new Spider-Man. He's a, he, uh, he looks like a high school kid. Yeah. How, he actually how looks great like is my, that? Yeah, I know. <laughs> how amazing. But uh, anyway, that's Yo, Gargoyles was great fun, and I did really cool. uh, an yeah. enormous amount of work on developing it. We wow. did card after card. And th- back then, that's how you did it. You did uh, what amounted to... Uh, uh, 11 by 17 uh, or, or eight and a half, well, whatever, uh, cards that showed scenes from story ideas okay. and all the characters and how they would interact and so forth. So it was a big series of illustrations and then somebody would pitch it verbally. Yeah, I've got an animated Batman book. That, it's the art of Batman or something like that. And I think that there's a lot of that sort of stuff in there. Because it, it had to be done and it was all internal because those were the days of the Disney afternoon mm-hmm. and it was all sold to, like, I think locally it was KHJ or somebody. Mm. Uh, but but it all had to be done uh, internally and sold internally uh, to Eisner and ultimately okay. and and um, and then it was just it wasn't a big deal to get it on to uh, stations around right because uh, they already they were doing they, running the Disney afternoon yeah. I think yeah. a lot of people my age who are in their twenties and thirties now who grew up with it look back on it fondly as having kind of a cool interesting vibe for Disney and has a lot of Trek actors you got Jonathan Frakes and Marina Sirtis from the Next Generation and. I'll give kudos to you on your designs because they were very, as they say in the show business, uh, toyetic. <laughs> I, I, I remember having all the gargoyle toys for sure. Well, uh, it, it was a lot of fun. To, and, and I did end up directing a bunch of those uh, after having come back from Warner Brothers, actually. Um, uh, it was my gig at Warner Brothers directing that got me directing back at Disney, which was nice. Um so yeah, yeah, Gargoyles was fun. They never put Disney on it. It says Buena Vista at the end. All right, that's right, because they would also yeah. have like Hollywood Pictures and other little mm-hmm. sub divisions for more mature or whatever right. you want to call. It. You don't want it under the Disney brand per se. There were uh, literally people at the studio that would not work on the show because it was considered to be too. Uh, satanic and demonic. Oh that's so cool. <laughs> well, but that's well, that's what I think is cool, though. Because that's Spock, r- right? Pentagram, right? But you also you've done stuff like you know the Disney princesses, and is it a different sort of animation style or vibe, or is it just like I'm drawing this character? This is what the story calls for, or is it just a different culture within even that sort of company? Well, what what's what's interesting is it's who ends up. What artist ends up being on the top of the pyramid? Gotcha. And with Gargoyles, when it was finally going to uh, film, that first uh, run of 13, I think it was, uh, it was Frank Parr who had been at Warner Brothers doing Batman. And so he applied what he had learned from Bruce Tim to Gargoyles because... He understood that that's where they wanted to go with it. So uh, that's why there are design similarities in the final screen version. When we were doing pitch cards, we weren't as concerned about what it would look like on the final screen. So there were a number of artists working on it uh, in the development phase that had different styles. And you would see that in the various cards. Um, One of the guys that worked on it at that stage... um, Gosh, went on to work at Features and do amazing stuff and is still there today, uh, Paul uh, Felix. Uh, and if you look him up, you'll find that uh, he was instrumental in everything from the Disney Tarzan to uh, uh, Lilo and Stitch. Oh, and, I love that uh, <laughs> all, all kinds of, well, these were the features. Yeah. These were the things that, and he, he, he moved with the Tarzan project from disney tv over to disney features because mm-hmm. disney features said nah you're not doing tarzan we're doing tarzan <laughs> and then of course disney tv did a whole bunch of tarzan stuff after that a series right. and some sequels and so on yeah cool so i'd love to thank bob klein for being here <laughs> i i 
it, there's so many questions you have answered, and it's just <laughs> it's kind of amazing that we we got this you know look into into this the world that we've been talking about for so long, but only story wise really, and you know look and feel, but not like the actual mechanics of putting it together. So thank you so much for joining us today. You are quite welcome. It was an absolute delight. <laughs> And where can we find you if uh, if people want to find you, like a, maybe a portfolio or... Oh, uh, well, I'm doing two um, uh, places right now on the internet, uh, and I'm doing them largely because there's... I can just put stuff up, <laughs> and it, and it's and it's great fun for me. And what I'm putting up are drawings and paintings that I've done over the last... 50 years, I guess, uh, all the way back to when I was in high school even. Uh, but they, they're they not industry things. They're all stuff that I did on my own time for fun or nice. the occasional um, publishing thing, you know, like a book cover mm-hmm. or something like that. Uh, but uh, I've been doing it for about two and a half years now on Tumblr, Okay. And on Tumblr, it's Bob Klein picture a day is what it's called. Nice. And then if you go, if you're, if you do Pinterest, there's, uh, you just have to look up Bob Klein art and uh, you will find it. Now, there's another guy who lives in Florida who is, calls himself Robert Klein, same spelling. And he does nothing but watercolors of mermaids. (laughs) <laughs> and mermaid people and so forth. Uh, Mer people. He if, watched too much Amber Grissel. So <laughs> if you if you find him and you think it's me, it's not. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, my stuff, in fact, when you go to the Tumblr pages, it almost gives you the impression that you're looking at a typical Tumblr page where someone has collected art from all different sources. Because uh, over the years, it's been more fun for me to explore different media, different design ideas, different subject matter. I mean, you'll find watercolor landscapes in there that are very traditional looking from, say, the 40s or 50s. And you'll see uh, just all kinds of stuff. And uh, I'm going to continue to do it until I exhaust my <laughs> my stuff or I just run out of steam. But uh, there was so much that I'd already done that I just felt like nobody's getting to see any of this. They haven't any other way of seeing it. So I just decided, okay, I'm going to put it out there for those who are interested. Awesome. All right. And Adam, where can we find you on the internet? You can find me smelling the pine saw in the wood panel den, of course. You can uh, find me. What, what, what would you eat in the wood panel den? Like Velveeta cheese? Like what's a 70s snack? I Onion dip. Onion dip. There Onion. we go. So you can snack. Or food sticks. Food sticks. <laughs> exactly. And ruffles. R- ruffles. Ruffles dip. Um, <laughs> you can find me on Twitter, D-R-0-S-I-N, or on Instagram at Adam Drosen. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram and Dribble and pretty much every other social media under the username GeekFilter. Well, geeking out about cartoons isn't the only thing we've been doing on Trek FM this week. Here's a listen to some of the shows you may have missed elsewhere on the network. Previously on Trek.fm, Standard Orbit. My casting choices, okay, would be for Ruck, you got to go with Dave Batista, right? Uh, he's uh, Drax in Guardians of the Galaxy. He played Jinx in... Uh... Yeah, Inspector. Yeah, was that Jinx? What's his name? Hinks, Mr. Hinks. Hinks, Mr. Hinks. Yeah, Mr. Hinks. That's the wrong James Bond film, everybody. <laughs> the 602 Club. Going back to the Gotham thing really quickly, I know this is semi-derailing. Um, why would you want to move to Gotham? I mean, he has to have been there. It's like the picture that he has on his wall is this beautiful, shiny, like daytime view, if I'm not mistaken, of Gotham, which I don't think we ever see. Um, it was like, I'm not really sure. Charm City looks quite nice. <laughs> like so. Saturday morning trek. It's very much like a continuation of the original series. You know what? You raise a very good point, and it's one we probably should have talked about earlier, is that we talk so much about the animation and the limitations of the medium that we forget about the writing. And overall, it's pretty strong throughout the run. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm.
So check out the shows and get in on the Daily Trek Talk. You'll find them at iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, and the Windows Podcast Directory for Xbox and Zune. You can visit our website at trek.fm and view our podcast directory and stream all of our shows right from the website. We'd also like to invite you to leave us a rating and review on iTunes. Not only does it help us know how we're doing, it also helps other people find the show. Before we go, I'd like to thank our patrons, Eric Extreme and Ju Kim. Thank you so much for your support. And if you want to become an associate producer of a Trek FM show, all you need to do is become a patron of the network at the $25 or more level. Go to patreon.com slash trekfm and find out how you can become part of the team. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm. All of this talk about design and ships and color has really inspired me. I told Bob I was thinking about painting the den, and he said that he'd send me some color suggestions. Let's see. Green, purple, pink. Uh, maybe I'll just do some starship designs instead. Oh, and remember, there is an animated series. Come on, Cap. Let's go back to New York in the 1930s. You can fall in love with Joan Collins. And then she'll die. Let's go looking for Mr. Spork's brain. Or Harry Mudd. Or Roger Mudd. I want to swim with the whales. We're your biggest fans.